Hey, before we get into today's podcast with photographer and director Estevan Oriol, I wanted to tell you guys about a new file transfer tool I've been using lately called PicDrop. Uh, PicDrop is a really great file transfer tool um, that was actually designed by photographers with photographers in mind. Um, you can easily upload and uh, uh, download your photos when you need to send them off to clients. Your clients can uh, uh, make comments and selections. It's a private gallery. It's just really easy way to kind of communicate with your clients and deliver your files in an easy and organized spot. Um, for years, I was using like outdated platforms like uh, WeTransfer and Dropbox, but with PickDrop, um, they really designed the platform with photographers in mind, and uh, it's just kind of streamlined my workflow. I can easily just kind of drag and drop my files and access them on my mobile phone or laptop, wherever I'm at on the go. Um, just I really enjoy it. And with today's podcast, if you enter the promo code of PhotoBanter. One word, you get three months free of the pick drop file transfer tool. Um, so definitely go check it out and let me know what you guys think. And just remember to enter the promo code PHOTOBANTER, one word, when you sign up at pickdrop.com. And without further ado, we'll get into the Estevan Oriol interview today. Welcome back to the Photo Banter Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Gagne. And on today's podcast, I welcome back returning guest, photographer and director Estevan Oriol. Estevan welcomed me to his home in Los Angeles, California, uh, where he brought me through his morning routine um, before we recorded this podcast, where he spends 60 minutes in the sauna and then he does ice baths. Um, so a really unique experience that we did right before this uh, podcast interview was recorded. Um, and I was excited to speak to Estevan again. Um, I spoke to him about his uh, documentary that came out earlier this year titled LA Originals, uh, which is available on Netflix, which documents his more than 25 year career and longtime uh, collaborator, Mr. Cartoon. And I also speak to Estevan about his transition to a, a vegan lifestyle and how it's kind of affected his health and his daily life. Um, really interesting stuff. Um, and, you know, Esteban's been one of my favorite photographers for years and one of the hardest working people um, I know. He's always just working on projects and different businesses. Um, just really amazing photographer and director. Um, so I was excited to get him back on the podcast. Um, so I hope you enjoy and thanks so much for listening. I welcome back returning guest Esteban Oriol. Um, excited to have you back on, Esteban. Um, he brought me to your house today and brought me through your morning ritual of the sauna and ice bath, man, it was quite the experience. Um, when did you kind of start doing the sauna ice bath thing? Well, I started uh, some years back with a friend of mine, Marlon, in New York. He used to take me to the uh, Russian bathhouses, and uh, they had different setups there, different kinds of sauna rooms, and they had like a cold plunge. And every time I went to New York, I would hit him up and be like, hey, let's go to the Russian sauna spot. So it became a thing like every time I went to New York and then I hooked up with um, Pat Tenori from Ruka and started uh, shooting his his whole team of um, advocates that he has that represent his brand, which is, um, I'd say, roughly 20 fighters, 20, uh, maybe about... 20 street artists, 20 skateboarders, and 20 surfers, like some of the world's top athletes, mm. and they all do it. They all go to the hit the sauna, 20 minutes, ice, three minutes, and they do that three times. And I did it every time I'd go to their warehouse because he has a gym there, and then I'd do it every time we'd go to the North Shore, and they do it every morning. So I got kind of uh, sprung out on it. I was like, Man, I need to do this. So I went and bought myself a sauna and built this little area here because it was just dirt. And, uh, you know, I kind of made it like my little sanctuary type thing, you know, where I just go and uh, start out my day, hit the sauna, hit the ice, hit the weights, you know, just get ready for out there, you know, ready for the world. Yeah, man, I've never been in a sauna before. I was a little nervous going into it. Uh, but yeah, after like an hour of going through it, I just feel like, I feel like energized. It was, it's almost, it's like a workout in a sense, like pretty much. Yeah, it's like, you know, you're shocking your body with the heat and then the ice and you're doing it like three times back to back. It's it's good to like, you know, shock your system and, and also uh, it's good for inflammation if you have inflammation and 
it's basically like uh you know like i said it's like drinking a coffee without having to take a shit you know <laughs> it's a good analogy and yeah because like looking at your instagram man i know you, you're vegan now it seems like the health thing like you, you kind of been uh even because watching your doc- documentary la originals now you, you've lost a lot of weight and uh what kind of prompted you to start doing the vegan lifestyle and everything it seems like a kind of new lifestyle for you um well i have a couple of like existing medical issues um i have hypothyroid so my high my thyroid i had hyperthyroid when i was younger and they took it out so that uh, now i don't have a thyroid gland so they give me medication to trick my body that i have a uh, thyroid but it's always you know if they take it out you automatically go to you know slow the you know slow side of the gland so that's your uh, metabolism so when they took it out, I automatically gained 80 pounds. Oh, and shit. I just kind of got used to that and thinking, like, that's how I had to be, you know. Like, that was my excuse, you know. Like, you know, I, I'm hanging out with my homies in East L.A. with a car club, and all we do is eat big carne asada burritos and drink some beers. And, you know, like, you just accept that lifestyle. Yeah. And going to this place called The Hat, and you get the double burger with the pastrami and you get the chili cheese fries and the large coke and you know you just that's that's the day you know and i was like you know people would be like, oh man you're living good look at you you know you're living the good life you're eating healthy huh and i was like yeah yeah you know just you're going along with it but really i was poisoning myself mm-hmm. i was you know prepping myself for for diabetes and then uh I ended up getting uh, this other thing called pernicious anemia and then uh, uh, gout and neuropathy. And the neuropathy is what finally kicked it in, you know, to where I was like, I got to stop doing what I'm doing. I'm doing everything wrong. I got to reset. And I uh, got an infection in my foot from the neuropathy because you get these ulcers and they get infected and you can't feel it because you don't have you know no feeling you have constant numbing and tingling and burning Jesus. in your legs and your feet so i didn't really know that i had these <clears throat> issues and then i would look at my the bottom of my foot and i'd be like man i got this crazy infection i go to the hospital and they're like okay well they take out the sharpie and they're drawing on my foot like okay if we cut it here you know we'll get the immediate thing if we cut it here we'll we'll be safe we you know we won't have to go any further probably and i was like well is there anything i could do to change it at at one point in my head i was kind of like you know maybe it's better if i just start off with some you know a prosthetic because this pain and all this shit is just a lot of drama you know yeah but then when i'm sitting in there and they're drawing on me i was thinking maybe i should give it a one last shot so i I did the they're like you know no no meat and no alcohol because of the the gout so I cut that out then they said no sugar no starch no dairy because of the neuropathy so I cut all that out and I was just like man let me just try this all the way vegan thing and I went with that I dropped 50 pounds and you know which makes you feel better if you look better yeah and made me lighter on my feet and less, you know, weight carrying around on my, you know, your poor feet, you know, they carry around all this, this weight, you know, and, uh, can't be good for, you know, so I, I switched it up and, and I've been a lot healthier and everything's, you know, lining up better for me and I'm just going to stick to it. Yeah, I'd imagine this like losing the weight and it's probably even better for your mindset and stuff and you feel like you're even like more productive throughout the day just kind of with your work and everything with the new healthier lifestyle. Yeah, you're like lighter on your feet. You look better so you feel better and like all around you just like the whole thing is just, you know, it's a it's it's like kind of like uplifting for you in in every every way physically, mentally and, you know, I mean, you sit there and you look at yourself in the mirror, you know, when, when you're not in the best shape, and you're like, damn, look at that. Like That's where I'm at right now, dude. Like, when I go, I'm getting on a program next week, man, because it sneaks up on you, especially this pandemic year. It's just, like, stuck in the house, and yeah. this, like you're just, like, bored, and you just, like, eat food for no reason. It's, yeah. Before you know it, you feel like shit, and you're just, like, sluggish, which yeah. is, like, the worst way to be. So many people got fat, yeah. fatter, or fat or fatter, you know? <laughs> and I was like, damn, look at it. 
like they're they're not on a they don't have the the discipline and the programming you know so i was telling all my my crew like hey you know we don't have to go out there you know everything was closed the gyms the restaurants all that so i was like let's just you know get tighter you know now's the time like you know instead let everybody else is getting fattier fatter and unhealthier and let's get healthier and, and in better shape so we set up a little gym like me my son uh the guys that i work with a couple of the homies and uh my my daughter's boyfriend we and my daughter mm -hmm. so every morning from like 6 30 to 7 30 my daughter and her two friends would come and work out and then from 8 to like 10 or 11 me and my guys would come so it was like five of us five to six of us and then in the afternoon my son and my daughter's boyfriend they would hit it so like all day long my pad was like working out sauna ice you know with with maybe anywhere from 10 to 12 people a day damn that's awesome it's, it's a cool environment like kind of motivate each other like you can't be slacking it's like hey we're show up we're gonna be here it's like if you don't they probably give you a hard time like where you at man here yeah, yeah for sure and then each group was like kind of in a, like mini competition <laughs> like we'd call ourselves the sauna boys then they were like you know the girls would come early in the morning the afternoon guys you know they were like they hit the weights more so they're like in, you know they had that more like bodybuilding type thing going on so we we all were like hey you know you guys coming today you know you're not you're you're running late today you know we'd we'd give the other groups hassles you know <laughs> you got the whole fam on the vegan uh vegan uh diet too or not not as much no my my son eats real healthy because he works out a lot mm -hmm. so he eats pretty much everything organic you know yeah and then uh my daughter's vegan and and her boyfriend is in and out of vegan or organic and then my daughter's sons are mostly vegan damn man i might have to give this a try estevan because not only is it healthier for you like from reading it i had a friend who just went vegan for like the environmental issues because it's yeah. the amount of like uh like i know this is a photography podcast but this is interesting yeah uh yeah but just the environment with all the like factory farming and stuff it's like going vegan they say is just better for the environment overall so it's kind of a win-win i guess yeah yeah they say you know i i don't know what uh all the statistics are because you know both sides will come up with everything then everything's fake news or you know who, mm -hmm. who knows what's what you know mm -hmm. i'm not a scientist or nothing but i sure don't feel as bad as i did before you know eating just like whatever and as much as i could and like because i was raised you know my mom was like hey we can't afford nothing make sure you eat everything yep you know if you order something off the menu you know we're not doing it like that so make sure you eat all of it yeah so if I ordered some food, boy, you know, I was walking, I was barely walking off that table, you know. Sometimes I'd want to call an ambulance just to wheel me to the car. <laughs> but, you know, it's just, uh, it's unhealthy, you know, the way, uh, I don't know, just the way everything is, you know. Like if you go to the market, the whole cereal aisle, you could just wipe that shit out, you know? Yeah. It's all cereal and cookies. Like, it's like sugar. All that shit is straight poison. Yeah, preservatives They're, and all that and shit. You're, you're teaching the kids, like, at a young age, to just, like, here, poison yourself. Eat this sugar-frosted flakes, you know, and all this other shit. And you're like, man, like, now that I'm older, I think, like, what a cold-ass world, you know? There's companies that just pump poison into people and, and like think that's cool you know well not even that when you think about the cereal stuff every cereal box is like bright colors and has like cartoons on it like whatever to get kids on early and it's like the same thing with like fast food the reason they give toys out is because kids want the toys and they get hooked on it and then before you know it, you're addicted to all that stuff that's sugared so it's like a vicious cycle you know yeah it's horrible it's it, i can't even believe uh i can't believe that the um that they allow them to do that shit you know mm -hmm. like that they uh, that they allow the these fast food chains to just you know you it, it, the other thing i noticed when i got healthy is i would look at people when i would go to eat at places you know before i was like man i'm gonna go in here and get a pizza for an appetizer and a pasta and a dessert and you know just like i i just wanted i looked at food and it looked good i was gonna eat it you know yep and now I look at people that 
eat at those kind of places and pretty much if you go into one of those style places like 99% of those people are obese yep and when I went to the doctor I just thought I was like a cool you know 20 30 pounds overweight and he would show me this chart and it would go like yellow to green to red and it was like a weight and height chart so it was like you match your height with your weight yeah and it, and it would tell you like you're either in the yellow the green or the red yeah and i was in the red you know like the lowest one but a morbidly obese he's like hey man you know you should slow down i was like for what you know i'm living the good life you know he's like i don't know about that Look here on the chart, you know, these, I didn't make this chart up, it's been around for years. I was like, oh shit, man, you know, that's crazy, you know, but then I would still leave there and go eat like a double cheeseburger or something, you know, some french fries and I'd be like, man, that shit's crazy, you know, I don't feel like I'm morbidly obese, you know, and then I'd be like, man, there's, how can I not be, look at, you know, and uh, and once I started eating healthy, like everything started changing. My, was- was that like a tough transition? Was there like a moment? Because like L.A., there's like a taco truck on every corner. There's all these places you can eat. Was it? Did it take you a couple of weeks to kind of get you get used to those new like habits and stuff? Or? Yeah, it was hard, super hard. Yeah, but you have to go like cold turkey and just. The good thing is, I have a friend, skinhead Rob. He used to play in the transplants, oh, and yeah. he's the one who invited me or introduced me to um, Travis Barker. And you know, that's how I end up getting all that work. Yeah. But all that was because of my friend Skinhead Rob, who's been vegan for years, and he would take me to these spots. I was like, hey, man, I need to change up. And he goes, don't worry, I got you. And he'd take me to this Thai place that was vegan only. And yeah. he's like, try this, this Thai beef jerky. It's, you know, there's no meat in it at all. It's all plant-based. I was like, whoa, <laughs> man, that's crazy. Like, there's nothing here that's meat or dairy. He's like, nothing. Damn. And I just started eating all these spots that he was showing me here in L.A. Like, if you want to try vegan, L.A. is the best place because here they have, like, a chef that's doing every kind of, Ita- like, Italian food, Mexican food, you know, burgers, whatever you want. They got the best chefs doing it here in L.A. It's all vegan, and you'll be like, yeah, I could do this, you know, so... I just stuck to it and started buying my own food and reading what was on labels. And if if you can read something and you know what the, what it what it is on the label, then you know you know what you're putting in your body. But if you go and read these other ingredients, it's got like and, 26 letters. It's yeah, like, <laughs> like all these words that never xylophone, whatever. They're not even in the dictionary. <laughs> no. And uh, you know you're putting that in your body. Yeah. So I'm like, man, I I want to keep. My dad's 78. Yep. And he's been eating healthy for a long time. So, like, that's my goal, you know, to be in shape and live that long. Yeah. I saw Facebook did a a video of you and your father together. That was a cool video. You guys were, like, boxing and fighting and stuff like that. That was rad, man. Yeah, my dad got me into... My dad got me into boxing when I was a young youngster, before I was a teenager. Yeah. So, I just would do it, like, you know, here and there throughout the years and... You know, when I got old enough to do it on my own, I did. And you you photographed a good amount of boxers over the years. Yeah. I was thinking of doing a tab on my website, you know, under the sports, like just fight, you know. And then I have like Muay Thai, MMA, Jiu-Jitsu, uh, boxing. You know, I have it all, like from amateurs to the best pros. Yeah. So I was thinking of doing a little tab on that because, you know, I've been to Thailand and shot the, the fights over there. And wow. What was that like? It was, it was it was great, you know, because I'm a fan of it, and I've I did Muay Thai boxing here in in L. A. for like ten years, and uh, my dream when I was doing it here was to go to Thailand one time and do it there, you know. Damn. And I ended up going to Thailand, like ten to twelve years in a row, uh, once a year. Like we go there for like two weeks, and I'd film and take pictures of cartoon tattooing and. Um, I would always hit the gyms every time I go there. Yeah, boxing is just a sport with, a sport with so much history. And, I mean, it, I was so bummed when HBO Boxing got rid of their program because they always had, like, the best fights and stuff. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I love boxing. MMA is cool, but for me, boxing is just, like, so classic. And this like, I feel like you, you, can't, you can't take a bad picture of boxing. Yeah. There's just so much, like, character there, you know? 
Yeah, it's old school, but, you know, if you start doing the MMA now, mm -hmm. in, you know, 10, 20 years, you're going to have that classic old school MMA pictures. You know, that's what I've learned with photography is like, I'm doing, I'm capitalizing off of everything I did in the 90s now. Mm -hmm. So that means the next wave is going to be like 2010, 2000 to 2010 when the 90s stuff isn't cool no more. So that means everything that I'm shooting now will be cool in 2030, 2040, or maybe 50, you know? So everything that I shoot, I shoot with the intention of it might not be cool now, but it's going to be in 20 years. Yeah, that's one thing I've looked at your work. You seem like you're not someone who's like with the social media age. Everyone's in a rush to like whatever work they shoot to like get it out there as soon as they can. Put it on their main page, put it on their story, put it all over there. But yeah. it seems like you you really do look long term in your photography projects and you, a lot of your great work. You do these amazing books and you really you kind of take your time before you release your work out there. It seems like yeah, I'm not in a rush. You know, the, these guys are like they're like. Uh, you know, I've said it before, but they're like the spray and pray photographers. You know, they shoot a thousand shots and they hope they get one, you know, but everybody can, you know. Anybody in the world, you could shoot a thousand pictures, you're going to get one. So they're also the same guys that are uh, wi fi -ing their photos to their phone and, and posting it within, you know, seconds. Like, you know, it's like fast food to me, you know. It's like, well, that's cool, but, you know. I wish you could have took your time and, you know, did a little something more with it, you know. But, I mean, most of the people now, I see them, they'll Wi-Fi the photos to their phone. They have Lightroom on their phone. They Photoshop the shit out of it yep. and post it. And it's like, man, it's like not even a... Back in the day, a photograph was a moment of time. You captured a moment of time and and that's what it, it you froze it for that moment you know and that's what that would be living forever mm -hmm. that moment of time whereas other moments of time that weren't photographed you know they're just a memory but nobody else would see it or know about it but now it's like with all the apps and and all the programs and everything it seems to me like it's half photograph and then half graphic you know with by the time they're done photoshopping and hdring it to death and doing all these you know these effects on the photos it's like yeah it was a photo when it started but now it's been you know digitized to to death like pretty much half of the photo is a photo and then half of it is digitized like I don't know if you'd call it like art or graphics or whatever. Yeah, it's just like manipulated. manipulation. Yeah. yeah. So to me, it takes away from the actual photo and moment of time. But you know, it's the new the new way. You know, the new era. So you either get with it or or don't or or just you know stick to doing what you do and pay the price. You know, later like I have, but. I just like doing film, old school, you know, film and digital, uh, dark room. I don't even really like to do the digital prints, mm -hmm. but I will if that's what the, if the customer wants digital photography and digital prints, that's when I do that. I would, I would imagine, maybe I'm wrong, but like, because the thing I've always enjoyed about your work is because you have, have had the same like approach in the cameras you shoot, the film you shoot, and it's this gigantic body of work over the course of co the career that it's all um, it's all cohesive. But have, when clients come to you, I would imagine they would want you to shoot the way you shoot. But is it a lot of times they still want you to shoot digital just because they want it quick? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody has uh, deadlines in mind anymore. Yeah. Everybody, uh, back in the day, you would plan out something. Mm -hmm. You know, you knew that on the first of the month, I need to have this advertising campaign done. So I'm going to plan it the first of the month prior to that. I'm going to schedule, you know, the shoot the first week. The second week, we'll shoot it. The third week, we'll edit, you know, pick the photos. The 
the fourth week we'll get the prints and the and the layouts and everything done so by the first everything will be done now i get phone calls like hey uh you know i was wondering if you could do a shoot for me you know like today or like tomorrow or the next day because i have a deadline when's the deadline well we were trying to do it today but you know if you could do it in two days i could push it for two days and in my head, I'm like, well, who, what, what is the, why does the deadline have to be in two days? Yeah. Like, nobody's waiting for anybody's album to come out anymore. Like, before you used to wait, like, oh, man, I can't wait till this album comes out. Like, because you didn't see or hear from that artist for months or maybe years. Yeah. Or if you did, you were, it was, they were on tour for two years. So you, the time you got to see them is if you went to one of their shows and if they didn't get radio play or video play on MTV, you didn't see them. But now it's like you see people brushing their teeth in the morning. You see every meal they eat, you know, every second of these artist days. So it's like not so special when, you know, I mean, some people, if they're that great, it's a big deal. Yep. But most people are just like... Oh, I, did you hear so and so's new record? And I didn't even know anything came out. Yeah, he put it out last week. I'm like, shut it. How would I know? Yeah. Even if even if you follow them, Instagram doesn't let you see everybody's stuff. You know. Yeah, it's so cr- it's like, how do you, how can you keep up with everybody's just massive amounts of content that they're putting out on a daily basis? You know. Yeah, I think it's yeah, like we were saying. It, it, when you wait to put out your stuff, you wait until you're fully ready and you've been working on stuff for years. And then when it comes out, I would imagine people are more pumped. It's like when, like whenever, like Quentin Tarantino puts out a movie because he only puts out a movie like maybe once every five years or something yeah. like that. But when it comes, everyone's like hyped, and I'm, I'm gonna go see that. So yeah, like, and it's special. Yeah, it's. But if he was doing a short film every every day with his iPhone, you would be like. Tch give a fuck i see all that shit he does every day like yeah it's watered it's down not special to me yeah yeah it's, it's you know oversaturated so you know it's just how people you know there's some people like they're they do good because they're you know so consistent with everything mm-hmm. like every day they're doing something at this time and you know they're they're consistent so it's like sometimes that that works but for me, I'm like, you know, I look at some of my posts and they're like three, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. And I'm like, hey, I should, I'm going to post today. Yeah. And then I'm like, I can start looking for something to post and I'm ah, forget I'll do it later. <laughs> and it's like, goes for another week, you know? Yeah. I just get caught up in doing stuff that needs to be done. Yeah. Doing the actual, like taking pictures and yeah, like running shooting, the business. I shoot film every day. Yeah. So every day if I shoot film, I'm picking up the film from two days ago. So and then like, you know, scanning it or, you know, picking shots that I like. And like there's something for me to do eight hours a day every day, even if it's not a job that day. Yeah. And I know I know I mentioned you, I messaged you a couple of weeks ago. And I know during the pandemic, your longtime lab, Shulman Lab, where I know for years you've been getting your film developed there and prints and stuff closed. Uh, so how's that transition been to finding a new lab and like someone to work with? Because I know that relationship is uh, important and harder and harder to find like quality labs these days. It's a real like uh, uh, specialty. Yeah, Shulman uh, is a guy named Russell. He'd been in business for 45 years and... I was working with them over 15 years. I want to I want to say like 18, 17 years, but I know over 15 for sure. And uh, he called me up and he's all, hey, man, and, you know, I'm done. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, I'm closing the lab. And I go, why? He goes, I can't do it no more. The guy's on me for the rent. We've been closed. I don't have money, you know, coming in. So, you know, I got to give it up. Yeah. It's expensive here, you know, on Sunset Boulevard. I was like, man and then i thought about it i was like you know i was ready to do a gofundme for him and you know really put it out there and he was like i'm cool you know like thank you yeah but i was like i wish he would have just said you know been like with it you know but i think everything just was overwhelming and keith had enough you know he's like fuck it you know too much stress yeah but since then i've been to maybe five photo labs in l.a 
um, some labs won't uh, they'll develop the film but they won't do real contact sheets yeah and then some labs don't have um, they do the digital contact sheets but you can't see them you can't see it's them. all like pixelated. It looks yeah, like shit. Small, and yeah. you can't see them through a loop. You look at them through a loop, and it looks like a low, super low res picture. Mm -hmm. So I like to get my film developed at a lab that has a reputable um, reputation, to where you, you, you know, you know that they're not messing up your film, and then they print contact sheets in the dark room, and uh, a lot of labs don't do that, and then each printer has their own style and Russell's style was what I like to see and so for every printer I go to they have their own style and it doesn't match what I was putting out there before into the world so I don't want people to think that I changed up my style because I changed up my printer you know I, I want to find a printer that matches my style the way it's been putting out into the world for all these years so I think I, I I found the right combination of places. I go to one place to develop the film. I go to another place to develop the contact sheets. Holy and shit. And then I have another guy that does the prints. Damn, that's a process. Whereas before it was a one-stop shop. Damn. Yeah, that is like an important relationship in your process is like having a, a good printer and someone who can process and... It's like a it's like a shorthand between you and the person, the printer or whatever of like what you want and yeah. I'm sure that this kinda of takes time and find a new person, you know. The printer I use is he's great, you know, he's a good printer, but for the contact sheet the film developing is double the price of everywhere else. The contact sheet is is double the price of everywhere else I was going. And the prints are three times the price of what I was getting for at Showman. Mm. And I'm like, hey, man, can you hook me up? Give me a discount. You know, I'm, I probably shoot the most film out of any photographer in L.A. Yeah. And he's like, oh, you know, that's the that's the price. You know, times are tough right now. I'm like, okay, cool. Then, So then I had to not go to them for uh, developing and contact sheets and just go to him for prints if people want prints. Mm. Which, in you know, I would say in a couple of months I did a maybe about a good three thousand, four thousand dollars of work for there. So I was like, "Do you want that work or not?" You know. Mm -hmm. and either way, I'm gonna get my film developed and my stuff contact sheets, but I'm not gonna pay triple and double the price just because. I want to keep it at one place, you know? Yeah, I get you. I don't have a problem driving over here to get the film developed, driving over there to get the contact sheet, and driving over there to get the print. It's no big deal. Yeah, do you just want the end, end, uh, the quality to be good and what you want, your end vision? Um, and I guess, like, obviously it's been a crazy last year and a half with the pandemic and stuff. Like, um, how's work been for you, and how have you kind of, like, kind of gotten through this crazy time? Have you still been kind of shooting a lot of personal work or commercial work or how's this kind of the pandemic i guess affected you at the time uh when the pandemic came i had just collected all my money from jobs and i had three more big jobs coming up it was uh dickie's genesis and uh another job and i was about to shoot those and, and the shoots were set up the dates were locked in so i was counting on that money and the pandemic hit and everything got shut down and those jobs went away and i was like wow you know like what am i going to do now yeah and at the same time la originals was coming out the documentary i did of me and cartoon and we were supposed to go to south by southwest and release it and we were going to be headlining there and we were going to be the only film showing two days in a row oh wow and we were going to shoot uh, our film was going to show one night the first night headlining then it was going to show the next day during the day and then uh spike jones with the bc boys doc was going to be that night so it was like us and them back to back but our film was the only one playing two days and everything was shutting down and we we're like netflix was the only company that wasn't pulling out and they pulled out last and they're like hey 
we're not going to south by southwest and i was like wow this is really real now you know like all my jobs got canceled all my money had come in from previous jobs and the movie was you know we weren't going to the festivals so it's kind of a bummer and then april 10th came along and the movie dropped and everybody i guess was tired of watching the tiger boy yeah <laughs> and and uh our shit took off and it was trending and it went to number one yeah you're on that like the the main page the feed that has like the top 10 yeah. on netflix and you guys were right up on there yeah it went to number one on documentaries and number four in in the uh all across the board mm. so that went incredible for us as far as a release of a movie and then people started researching my name at that time i think i had 162 or 63 thousand followers on instagram yeah and because of the movie and all that i've gone up to like 431 now it's like almost half a million people that's insane so <laughs> you know that was a big push for me and then a lot of people went to my merch store and bought you know we're buying up the books buying up t-shirts and everything the first week was crazy you know like i was i was kind of panicking because both of the the places that fulfill my merch closed down too because everything Go had ahead. to close yep. so i was like well what do i do you know everybody's buying stuff and there's nobody at the warehouses to ship the stuff yep. so i was calling both warehouses one guy wouldn't answer my calls at all another guy would because i have two i don't know why there's been like some mix-ups and stuff so i have two merch sites on that carry my merch and they're like different stuff because one guy was like you know we can only carry this because this stuff sells and the other stuff you know doesn't sell as much so we're not gonna you know you got to pick it up and get it out of here so then i took it to another spot and set up over there and then those guys were able to open they figured out a way to uh, be open and be essential during the COVID. And they started making masks. Mass, yeah, so they could stay open. So then I just was like pushing that side because I was like, well, now these guys are there, so I at least I know things will get shipped mm -hmm. because uh, people think that because there's Amazon and you can get stuff shipped the next day, even like groceries and stuff. They think it, everyone should be like that. Yeah, you can order frozen food and it'll still show up frozen. Yeah. So they think that my site's like that like i have a warehouse with a thousand people in there with big conveyor belts and trucks going out all the hours of the night yeah but it's just a mom and pop thing you know it's like me and my two guys that work with me and and that's it mm -hmm. and then so you figure everything was selling and selling out and then i couldn't get my stuff made nowhere because everywhere was closed so then I had to find little places that were rent, like renegade print shops and stuff that were still open. To fulfill like t-shirts yeah, and the, printing you know, and make all the, that. Make the stuff that was selling out, I had to make new merchandise. Then we were running into the problem. We're like, okay, well, you, there's no black or no medium blanks of these t-shirts because there's no boats coming in because yeah. of the COVID. So now you can't even get the stuff remake you need. shit because nothing new was coming in. Everything was selling out, and I was like, "This is getting real," you know. Because then you probably got customers like, "Where's my stuff?" Yeah, uh, where's my stuff? You know, I ordered it two weeks ago, and I'm like, "Hey, you know, there's, I don't know if you know, there's a pandemic. Yeah, like the plague, you know, hits every hundred years. It's hitting right now. Yep. But uh, you know, it's cool that you ordered. Thank you very much. But you know." Got can you cut me a little slack buddy you know i'm going to every shop in la that sells blank hats and they're all closed every shop that sells blank shirts they're all closed every place that prints shirts they're closed you know but i am finding little you know little things in the grooves here so you know have, be patient and don't trip i got you hmm. like i want you to have it more than than you do you know yeah yeah so I finally found little places here and there that, like, this guy was backdooring, you know, T-shirts. This guy was, you know, backdooring his hats. And I found a way to, you know, navigate through what was going on and make everybody happy, you know? Yeah, and it seems like, because I know you've had the merch store for years, but it seems like it's even expanded more. You have more products on there. It seems like it's kind of grown a lot, even grown more throughout the last year or so. Well, that was the other thing that saved me was 
everybody started finding out ways to to keep at least keep the merch going mm -hmm. so i started doing collabos with people you know so i collabed with um my friend cholo freight creeper we did a collab shirt i collabed with uh fools gone wild and um born and raised yeah. and uh cookies was well, when you did a spray paint can i think there was like a like a few hundred of them it was like a spray paint can yeah. that came like a wood box that was that was yeah. a cool one that was the last one i did that was with uh, montana spray paint cans mm. and that went good you know like everything we were doing was selling out was so that was like my new my new hustle because i've been living off photography since uh i quit tour managing cypress hill in 2005 so i've been living off strictly photography commercial assignments magazines all that merch everything everything i do is based off photography whether if i'm putting it on a t-shirt and selling it or on a, a towel or whatever you know it's all from photography yeah so i've been living off my photography alone since 2005 and uh I would say 2020 was the hardest year, but the best year because it really uh, put me to the test and it was the uh, most challenging. And I think it it did the best for me Man, in every way. So, um, you know, now 2021, I'm just trying to keep up with 2020, you know? Yeah. And then I got the COVID in, Feb in uh, February of this year. So that set me back, um, I think, uh, 20 days. Damn. I had like 10 days at the house and 10 days in the hospital. So that was uh, very real for me. <laughs> What's up, doggy? I uh, tried to uh, I tried to do the, I saw the president. He said if, if we inject bleach, yeah. that would kill the COVID. So I tried that. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work so uh, um this hit the, hit the sauna harder <laughs> yeah and then i i finally uh surrendered and went to the to the doctor and the the doctor said hey man you're pretty sick you know you need to check in the hospital mm. and i was like yeah hey can you know look out for me i i can't go out like this you know he goes don't worry i got you so i went uh i stayed in the hospital for 10 days holy and shit probably the second day in there after they're giving me all the the medications and the the ivs and everything i felt better but then it was like a five or seven day thing where it was like a a cycle you had to do like a seven day cycle yeah with the with the medicine so i did that and i felt better like like instantly but i lost my taste my smell all my strength i couldn't eat nothing and um it was probably the the weirdest feeling sick i've ever been yeah i had a couple I've of had friends the got flu it bad you know yeah it sounds terrible like had the flu knock me on my ass you know thought i was gonna die and shit but this like took everything from me i was like hey this might be it this might be the one yeah and then i was in the hospital and they'd be like you know code red 229 you know room six and like the nurses are like doing shit to you and then they just run out of the room you know and then like you they just come back in like the air deflated from them and you could just tell that somebody died and you're like man you know like i hope this ain't me you know but i was feeling better day by day but it was kind of scary when you go there because like you, you go to the the hospital and they're like uh you know why are you here today and they're like covid and you go oh go to that tent over there you know like don't come over yeah, here, like, over yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so i just go in this you you're in the tent in the parking lot like you know they're like what the f you know what the hell you know like i'm in a tent in the parking lot and i'm sick like i feel like i'm dying and you guys throw me in the tent yeah you know for a couple hours but it was that real you know people thought it was like fake and like you know i thought i was i wasn't there was no way i could get it i was like man i'm doing vegan stuff i'm healthy i'm hitting the sun and the ice like i'm a savage you know yeah. beast mode blah 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 and, uh, i was in the hospital going out yeah where's all that now you know yeah and uh I, you know, the way the nurses come into your room, they like, you know, all hazmatted down with like face masks and breathing apparatuses and stuff. 
uh, the, you know, pretty much like you see in the movies, you know, and scary I was scary like, shit. Yeah. I was like, man. And then the, you know, they're rushing out of the rooms and you're like, people aren't even making it off this floor. It's called the COVID floor. Yeah. And they weren't, you know, going home. And I was like, man, you know, like if I get out of here, it's going to be a new, a new me, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's what it's been ever since. That's awesome, man. Can't stop Estevan, man. There's more photos to take, more books to publish, and more stuff to do. So I'm glad you got through that, man. Yes, sir. Um, and it seems like you've been doing some cool stuff. Like you, you did a partnership with like Hyundai. Like they did a whole like commercial kind of based around you shooting uh, for I think it was that what the Hyundai Genesis that they, the commercial yeah. just came out. Like how how'd that kind of come about for you? Uh, my partner um, Marco, he works with. He has a company called the ID Agency. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was a big partner of mine for many years in SA Studios. So um, they had the Genesis account and they wanted to do something with me where I bring in two photographers that I like that are, you know, friends of mine. And we do a kind of like a content series called uh, Shutter Speed. And it was for Motor Trend the used to be a magazine but now it's just you know a website yep. and uh they have a big audience so i was for me i was you know excited and happy to be on you know something that that big of a platform alone just being on the motor trend yeah. page and then to be given the opportunity to bring in two of my friends that i you know respect and i like their work to bring them in on a job and you know get their story out there that was another cool feeling and then you know to do mine was was cool you know but you know it's, I had to think of different stuff because you know LA Originals had just come out and I don't want to tell the same story over and over so you know you gotta come at it with a different angle so that not everything out there about you is the same thing you know at least it's consistent and people know that it's not yeah you know bullshit because you know the same things coming out every time Mm -hmm. but at the same time you want to do new stuff and put more stuff out there and you know keep keep it interesting because i don't want to see the same story of somebody 10 times on 10 different podcasts but he's saying the same exact thing you know yeah definitely like how do you approach those brand deals because like like with you because now you do have like a huge following and, and there's brands you're working with different brands like hyundai and i think you said you work with a motorcycle company and like some other stuff like how do you approach those like brand deals now that you do have this following and companies want to partner with you to do stuff like how do you approach like what companies you want to work with i guess well uh he, my friend marco he uh I, I sit him on him. You know, I tell him, hey, this brand wants me to do this. Can you talk to them? Like, I'll talk art stuff with them all day, like concepts and everything. But a lot of brands and people and companies like to take advantage of artists. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's happened before, and I'm, I'm over it, you know? I'm like, it's cool you guys make all the money, and, you know, you guys are getting the pat on the backs from your bosses and everything, But and I'm doing the work, you know? So to me, I'm like, at this point, um, I'm saying no to more stuff, which is a good feeling, you know, because, you know, if you come at me directly, I have a hard time saying no, you know, Mm because I'm just trying to help everybody out and be the nice guy and do all this. And I like to be busy, you know. Yep. But like DJ Quick, you know, once said, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. And um, I try to, you know, a lot of stuff I shoot, because I shoot probably every day, I would say 80 to 90% of the stuff I shoot is for me, Mm -hmm. you know, just personal projects, just for the love of photography. But if there is money on the table and if it ain't the right amount, I just want to be able to say no, you know, just be like, you go use somebody else that, you know there cuz i like to think there's levels to this you know and and uh everybody shouldn't get paid the same stuff you know the guy that works the cook that's flipping burgers at McDonald's shouldn't get paid as much as the Michelin yep. star chef 
at the at the restaurant in Beverly Hills, you know? You got that black belt. It's like, yeah, you, it's like you put in the time, the effort, and your, your catalog of photos and portfolios speak for itself, and people want to use it. They got to pay for it. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think I put in my time and my I have experience. So I should get, you know, compensated by these big, huge companies that want to come in and, you know, culture vulture or whatever off of different things. And, you know, I like to uh, bring whatever community I'm shooting for, I like to bring them into the job too, you know, mm -hmm. like from the gate. I'll be like... If you want to do this, we have to do this, this, and this yep. for the community. Like if you're going to photograph this talent, this is who you got to put some money back into the community, yeah, you whatever. Yeah, got to do it or else, you know, it's it don't make sense. You yeah. know, like I don't I don't like for them to just come in and do whatever they want and, and, and leave, you know. Mm -hmm. Like I want to, if you're going to come in to the, to the, whatever kind of culture it is, it might not even be a culture that I'm in. But it'll be like, you know, if you're doing it with me, you're going to pay them too. Yeah. And somehow, some way. Yeah, you have lev you have leverage because you are a part of these cultures, whatever it is you might be photographing. Like, I know a lot, you've spent years documenting L.A. car culture. Yeah. And, like, we were talking about the fighters before. And these companies want to attach themselves. But they can't just go to these people and enter these worlds. Like yeah. you're a part of the world and you have leverage to sell your stuff. Because, like, so many times, like, I've had in my career, like, these big like fortune 500 companies who make billions of dollars and they make you feel like they're like you know they'll say shit like uh you know if you help us out on this one there's, yeah. there's more down the line there's never more down the line yeah they go to the next bigger guy yeah and they 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 do the same thing to him and they get him to do it and then they go to the next level guy and they they just keep going up the ladder yeah and it's not cool you know and i and i'm i try to you know put my foot down as much as i can with those those types and be like you know i just tell them straight out like if you want to shoot this you guys got to pay you know mm -hmm. like these dudes ain't gonna do the nothing for free no more no they're like aren't they your friends i go yeah they're my friends but why should they do something for free or a favor for me and you guys benefit everything like yeah. that's not cool or they want like full buyout on usage rights for whatever yeah, but they don't they, they don't want to pay it it's like yeah it's like i found myself like yeah same thing trying to push back more because like yeah like what's hurt you just got to ask the question like this is what i want and see what they say and then they negotiate from there i guess i don't know yeah i push back all the way you know yeah and i feel better you know and they feel better even yep like i do a lot of jobs and i'll say like they'll say like hey uh you know what's your rate on this how much can you and I'll go, 20 grand. Yep. Like, I'll just throw out a crazy number at them to be like, you know, this is the number. Yep. And they'll be like, well, we, we, you know, that like that's very high and that's, you know, a lot of money. Is there any way we can get around mm -hmm. that? I'll be like, well, if you don't want to pay the, the full rate, then maybe you could do something where you give me some of the money and you give some of the money to a charity and that's, you yep. know, something for you guys to write off or something like that even though it's all a write-off you mm -hmm. know it's all business mm -hmm. but however they want to put it or whatever is cool so i've had a couple jobs you know recently where they they couldn't pay me what they what what i wanted mm -hmm. so i got them to donate to some charities that i support Damn, and, that's uh, awesome. and they love it you know the charities are like oh man this is great thank you you know and like I, I, I gave some money to a charity of uh, veterans. My friends do. It's called the Sabo Foundation, mm -hmm. and they are a veteran um, char charity. And with the money that that I donated to them, they were they took uh, some of the veterans scuba diving. Wow. So, you know, these are guys, you know, they're amputees and, you know, going through PTSD and depression and and they were able to take them you know uh scuba diving off the coast of florida so you know that's a good feeling like you know that i'm able to help those guys that you know just shooting some photos for the day yeah definitely 
you like, know, I'm able to get my money so I can pay my bills and take care of my family and my friends and give everybody that I know work out of that yeah. where it fits in. And then I'm able to donate to a charity that that I know firsthand is is helping people. It's not like you're giving it money to a charity that, you know, they're doing a good cause, but they're getting so much money from donations that you don't even know what your money's going to, mm -hmm. you know, like they could be going to buying a new house for the CEO of the charity or whatever. Definitely. You know, like I know firsthand where this money goes because I see it in there. They'll send me pictures and be like, hey, look in, at the hand, yeah. look at the vets on the boat going, you know, they're about to do their first dive and you see these guys and, you know, smiles from ear to ear and, you know, one guy's missing an arm, one guy's missing a leg and, you know, you just know like that that money's doing a good thing, you know, right there. Yeah, man, that's all I've really respected about you. You you help out a lot of different people. Like anytime I've ever reached out to you, you always get back to me. You you always show love to other people on social media, and it is a competitive business. And so many people have the mindset of like take 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 take, but it's yeah. like no, man. Like you, yeah, pay, help yourself, but like help other people as well. And I think that's like an important thing to like you know share with other people. And I try to do as much as I can myself. Just like help out younger photographers who have questions or whatever, man. Yeah. It's just like it's not all just take take take. Yeah, no, I I try to give more than I take. Yeah. You know, I try to do way more going out than bringing in, you know, and um and it feels better, you know. Like I don't know how how these people sleep at night just taking. Yeah. You know, I'm like, yeah, how do they fucking, like, go through life just... But I don't think they even notice it. They're just such pieces of shit that they just think about themselves so much and yep. just, like, so fucking greedy that they don't even care. They yeah. don't, they're like, and? That motherfucker's homeless right there? What does that have to do with me? Yeah. I'm, you know, I don't think like that. You know, I've seen... I have family members that are, that are and have been homeless. Mm-hmm. And that is that shit ain't cool. And no, they didn't want to be homeless, or no, they weren't just a drug addict and they went to buy some drugs and they became homeless. Like they have mental illness, mm -hmm. and you know, or they had a you know some shit happen to them that not everybody has happened to them. You know, like there's shit that people go through that knocks me off my feet, and I've seen crazy shit. Yep. Like, my friends tell me shit that's happened to them, and I'm like, fuck, really? Like, and I, and like, because they're my friends, I ask a million questions. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, hey, how does that feel, man? Like, and they're like, they tell me, you know, because they're, they're my good friends. Yeah. They're like, it feels like, you know, it feels fucked up, you know, knowing this, doing that. I'm like, wow, that's heavy, you know? And uh, a lot of people don't go through that shit, you know? There's not too many people that are, you know, like I know a couple uh, people that are like, um, they're rape babies, mm. you know, and they're put up for adoption. And like, you know, I'm like, when I first heard, I'm like, what do you mean? You know, like, and they're like, yeah, my mom was, you know, this or that, and, and I'm a product of that, and I'm like, oh, fuck. You yeah, know, imagine like, going through life like that, knowing that's how you were born, man. That's a, You're going to have mental fucking drama for life. Right. And this, like, yeah, that's I can't imagine. And, and like, you might join a gang, and you might go to prison, and you might have some fucking, yeah. you know, some crazy shit happen in your life because of some shit that happened to you before you were even born. It's out of your control. Yeah. Yeah. And people just think, like, oh, they're, you know... Everything is like so on the surface, you know. They don't they don't care to dig a couple layers underneath there Think, yeah. to find out what the shit really is, you know. Yeah, man. And, it, and it, I'm getting all I'm getting all those layers, you know, and and that's why I feel like whenever I can, I need to just help people, you know. It makes you feel better. Yeah, definitely, man. You don't want to see people struggling. I mean, like. I mean, you know this. I mean, even from coming here like a year and a half ago, the homeless situation in L.A. is like out of control. It's crazy yeah. in San Francisco. And I'm sure you've lived here your whole life. If you've seen it, this, it's gotten worse, right? Like, Oh, man, I've never seen it like this. This is like, I would say it's 10 times worse than it's ever been ever. I mean, there's so much trash everywhere. There's so much tents everywhere. There's so many people like walking the streets. You could just see bipolar, schizophrenia. 
the I never seen it like this. It's crazy. Like there's like you go down Melrose, which was one of the high end places of uh I think I was there is that where like I was at Cantor's last night. That's like is that's that, Fairfax. Okay. But you go down Fairfax, yep. Melrose, which were like high end shopping places for like streetwear brands and stuff like that mm -hmm. and now it's just like the hood yeah you know, like there's a bunch of stores that are closed down and there's kids that just went and bought clothing racks and they put up the clothing rack in front of the closed down store and they're like Living. open for there's a sign on the metal gate that the the store pulled down like a year ago that says open for business and it's the kid with the clothing rack in front of the store selling shirts and hoodies and Whatever. I'm like, isn't that, isn't that crazy? Like, and the next door, the guy, he was able to make it through the COVID. So he's paying 10 grand to be on Melrose a month. Yeah. And here's a kid setting up every day for free with a rack in front of the store that didn't make it. And, and he's able to make the money. It's like, man, isn't that crazy? Like you're paying 10 grand. Like I'd be pissed, you know, I'd be like, that's fucked up. You know, I'm paying 10 grand to be on this street a month. Yeah. And these dudes are just coming in here popping up with a with a clothing rack in the back and are they laying out a blanket on the floor and they just have all these t-shirts folded up and they're like yeah you know if you want to you know want one of these shirts come and holler at me i'm on melrose i'm like man like you know that's 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 what all this shit has created yeah it's just like pandemic I, and it's out of control the the way the the way that all the politics went and you know the, we're in a you know we had a plague and i mean i never seen any of this stuff in my life and i'm i'm coming up on 55 and like i'm, I'm i've never seen politics go this way i've never seen a pandemic where so many people got sick i never seen the like the whole shutdown of the city like it went from shutting down to protests to riots to national guard to peaceful protests to you know then more people are getting killed by cops and more protests that you know go go you know not violent on the protester side but violent on the police side because they're they just start opening fire shooting like rubber bullets and and uh, pepper spray and taser and you were out there photographing all that gas flash bombs yeah i got it all why was why was it important for you to document that and like what was kind of your experiences kind of being there during such a i mean crazy time because it's a moment in my life mm -hmm. and um it's my city, you know. I live in L.A. I'm from L.A. I'm born and bred in L.A. I, I, ra I, I wave the L.A. flag everywhere I go in the world. And, the, yeah, I might not live on that street where the cops' cars are on fire and shit like that. And, and people are getting shot with, you know, rubber bullets and shit like that. But I live in the city, yep. you know, where, where it's happening. You know, you could you could go on that citizen app and you know be like those lawyers that used to be they used to call them ambulance chasers like every time there's an accident they'd be like hey if you need a lawyer mm -hmm. you know come right here you know i got you but you could go on that citizen app and be a street photographer and document you know a thousand things a day if you're really trying to do all that you know but it's kind of like Back in the day, having a police scanner. It was like, you ever heard of that dude, Ouija? That yeah. old photographer? The old he, school guy, yeah. Four by five dude, and he would just have, yeah, he had the scanner, and that's what he would do. He'd just go yeah. to the spot and have all these crazy things. And that was unique. Yeah. But now you can just hit that citizen app and follow follow all the hotspots in the city and just go shoot all kinds of stuff and hope you get there before they tape it off, you know? Mm -hmm. But I just felt like, you know, there was a, it was affecting everything that was happening was affecting my life you know at that time so i needed to take pictures for in 20 years 30 years 40 years you know like people are like hey do you have any photos of this hip-hop group in the 90s and um, yeah we're doing this thing on them right now if you have some photos you know can we check them out yeah sure so there's the there everything that's happening now yeah like 
everybody took pictures of this that shit going on when it was going on with their phones with their cameras and they were posting it this day and that day but for me i was like man i was seeing i was like where i was there was at least a hundred people taking photos oh, yeah. of what was going on minimum and they're you know posting it right away and people are reposting it and all that and i was like man i don't even need to post nothing mm -hmm. because it's already watered down and it's already played out and it happened today yeah and it's like as far as photograph wise of course the issue wasn't played out or, but i was like nobody needs to see my photos you know how many more photos do they need to see of this thing burning or that, you know, cop shooting at people, you know, rubber bullets or whatever, you know, do they, how many more things do they need to see of that, you know? So I'm like, I'm just going to hold it, you know, 10 or 20 years, I'll put it out, you know? It's like your history book of LA pretty much. Yeah, like that time and when this happened. Yeah. So, you know, that's kind of like what my books are like now. You know, they're all stuff that was back in the day. Like, my photos are, my books are of 20 years plus of my photos mm -hmm. and up till present, you know? Like, if I'm shooting a book on, say, low riding, you'll see from day one when I started shooting them up till now. Mm -hmm. And that's with all the books that I put out. So, you know, that's just how I, I look at stuff and think about when I'm shooting or like I could, ne I I don't ever have to shoot again ever, and I have enough content to put out till I die. Yeah. But, you know, in this day and age, you gotta you gotta keep up with the times and stay relevant, or you're gone. No, definitely. And I guess as like a photographer these days, like obviously you've shot so many different things from celebrities to all your different personal projects and whatnot. Like, what are you kind of inspired by now photographically? Is there anything you're kind of hoping to work on or like where are you at in terms of like your creative uh, uh, work, I guess? Uh, right now I'm doing a Cypress Hills documentary. So that's kind of like the next level up from the LA originals to me in my head, you know, cause me and cartoon did, you know, a certain amount of things with what we do over a certain amount of years, mm -hmm. but Cypress Hill, you know, blows us out of the water with all that they've done. And we come from that family, you know, we, we came in after they were already sold millions of albums into, you know, into that family and, we did our own thing, but representing them, and then, you know, we did our thing. Mm -hmm. But they had already been doing it for years, and we were able to, you know, get in the car with them and sit in the back seat and go for the ride for a while, and then we got out and we were, we did our own thing. Whereas a lot of the friends that have come and go in all of our circles, uh, they don't want to do the work. Mm -hmm. They just want to reap the benefits. You know, they want to uh, go to all the shows, VIP. Um, they want to make the make the same money, but without doing any of the music yep. or doing any of the work. They they think that, well, because I'm friends with him and he's just like me, that I should be making the same amount of money as him. Well, you didn't do that album. Mm -hmm. You're just kicking it. You're just hanging out. Yeah. Like, how do you expect to be the same level as them or equal to them you got to bring something to the table yeah like you know for me i'm bringing the table to the table yep but you you're not bringing shit you're just waiting for everybody to, you know unfold the chair for you and set it in place so you can sit your ass down and mm -hmm. and and eat you know mm -hmm. and that's not cool you know and, and those guys come and go and you know didn't work out so good for them and they might be upset or whatever but you know we did everything we could to help you you didn't you didn't want the help so yeah and with i guess with the cypress hill doc that you're working on is there anything you learned from the process of putting la originals that um you're going to bring to this new film or anything you kind of learned about this kind of the documentary process and putting a, a, a large-scale film like that together i learned everything yeah. you know like that was the first full feature doc that i learned i learned like i mean the yeah, I shot like 80% of the the movie was my footage. Yeah. Or maybe more. 
but um, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that you don't even think about that you have no idea of what that is or what it would be is that plane no it's fine sound like he's landing on top of our head <laughs> it's all right it's going by um yeah there's a lot of legal stuff there's a lot of like behind the scenes stuff that that the that the corporate people or the executive people um ask for and need and you're like you know to me i never even thought of that stuff you know you're, you're like, just trying to make a film yeah i'm just trying to make stuff look cool yeah but there's like yeah okay you make it look cool but then you know do you have things signed off and then how about the music you know what music goes best with this and then you know will those people give you the music for the price that you can afford because of your budget you know yeah so you have like a wish list of everything you want to do you know visually sound wise and then you have your budget which is the real the real deal yeah like what will your budget let you do and then you know like oh i can't get this song by this artist but maybe i'll get this one it was still known it's still a good song it wasn't the number one hit but it maybe it was like you know two albums later it was, it was their better best song on that album yeah so there's just all these little things that you go through like that and um you know we we're able to come out with a soundtrack which a lot of documentaries don't get to do yeah and uh we you know we got vinyls pressed up yeah i saw that was that was really cool. yeah that was awesome and then um you know i felt like it had a great presence on the streets i mean on the on the internet streaming mm -hmm. but you know here's me in cartoon we're like you know you know we're sons of la you know we're we're uh the you know the kids of the city that went out and tried to do something you know more than what you know most people they you know they just accept the the nine to five job and they're cool with that and and we need we need that you know mm -hmm. we need somebody that's like hey i'm gonna go to the my my job at the store today because i used to do that mm -hmm. I'm going to go to my job at the market. I'm going to work from 9 to 5. I'm going to go home, call my friends, hang out, watch TV, eat dinner, go to sleep, do that again. But we pushed for something different. And now it's like all over the internet, but there was no presence in the streets. So I went and bought like a thousand posters of myself and we did like a, a little... Uh, had, we had a street team do like a little street campaign oh, like the we paste we paste thing. Yeah. and stuff like that and they're like you know i don't know i'll never know what it did for the actual streams mm -hmm. you know if if what if the we pacing e equaled you know people watching the movie but people saw those you know yeah definitely. people would take pictures next to them tag us post us even like um there was a uh a, a news company that did a interview on cartoon mm -hmm. and they went and filmed them you know went and filmed the, as b-roll footage they filmed like the posters and stuff like that and you know it's cool to know that i was the one that you know did put all that together you know yeah because because the, the movie come, the netflix they put your your project on the platform and then that's it yeah they don't do they're anything. not out there advertising advertising it or doing it like i noticed they are on some things they like i noticed a wheat pacing campaign that they just put out they'll do it like on the big like huge like yeah, where the they've spent one. like a hundred million like dollars a, on it yeah if you're a documentary that nobody's ever heard of that yeah. nobody knows yeah they're not going to do that yeah so it's up to you to do it and i learned all that from cypress hill you know how to you know take your your record into your own hands and promote your own record and go on tour and you know do your merch and do everything from from the ground up on your own aside from what the record label is doing mm -hmm. so i took all what i know from learning from them and house of pain and i applied it to the projects that me and cartoon do and my own projects
Yeah, that's amazing. Well, Esteban, I could talk to you forever, man, but I guess to wrap up, like, uh, what's next for you? I know you got the Cypress Hill thing, but anything, uh, a still photo project or what's what's on the docket for you? The next uh, projects I have is um, the Cypress doc. Then um, I have uh, the Dickies campaign nice. that I was talking about. Uh, and also I have a book called uh, Bosozoku coming out in July that was supposed to already be here but because of the COVID and the shipping and all that they postponed it what's that about uh, about Japanese bikers oh wow and then I have uh, LA Woman 2 coming out through Drago and uh, low riding worldwide you know 30 years of photos uh, that's going to come out through Drago too wow and then I'm going to put out a book of being on tour from 92 to, to 2005. Nice. Like traveling the world with House of Pain and Cypress Hill. I'm going to put a book out on that and then, uh, you know, see where those four books take me <laughs> in the movie. And, you know, by then I'll have thought of some new stuff. and To the moon, man. We're going to the moon, man. Yeah, We're keep going. <laughs> well, Esteban, I appreciate you, man. Uh, like you. I said, I've always been a big fan of your work and appreciate your time. And for people listening, if they want to check out your work, where's the best place for them to go? I keep it simple for you guys. It's uh, estevanorio.com. My IG is Esteban Oriel. Yep. My Facebook is Esteban Oriel. <laughs> and uh, all that. Let's see. Oh, my Twitter is uh, Joker Brand. <laughs> okay. But it has my name underneath there. So, you know, I just keep pushing the clothing line, Esteban Oriel and Joker Brand. Yep. And then my photography and... Um, my 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 big play is to get into directing a, a feature films. Hell yeah! So, well, the documentary for Cypress Hill will be out on Showtime. It's coming out on next year, and I can't really say the date mm -hmm. because of you know. Yeah, NDAs all that. But if you're if you're smart, which all you guys are, because <laughs> you're listening. <laughs> Cypress Hill, weed. I got an idea. You know, there's a there's spring, a number. Springtime. Yeah, there's a number that goes with weed. You know, if you if you're good at math, you could do one plus one, and you'll get to two. Right on. Well, Esteban, thank you so much, man. All right, thank you. So there you have it. That was the Estevan Oriel interview. Uh, just want to thank Estevan for uh, taking the time to come on the podcast again. It's uh, always a pleasure talking to him about uh, his work and everything he's uh, working on. Um, definitely go check out Estevan's Instagram and give him a follow. It's at Estevan Oriel, uh, as well as his website, EstevanOriel.com. Um, you can go check out all his work on there. And he's got a lot of cool like merch, uh, T-shirts with his photography work on it and different stuff. Um, so definitely go check that out. I'll put the links in the descriptions. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, um, with this podcast, um, if you go to pickdrop.com and enter the promo code PHOTOBANTER, one word, you'll get three months free of the PickDrop file transfer tool. And, you know, like I said, I've been using the PickDrop uh, file transfer tool for a while now. Um, really enjoy it. You know, I, I pay for the service myself. It's not like they're just giving it to me for free. Um, I really believe in the product and use it myself on a daily basis. I can access my files on my on my mobile phone on the go if I need to uh, download or upload photos for clients. And it just really kind of streamline my workflow. And uh, clients have been loving it too. So definitely go check it out and let me know what you guys think. And like I said, just go to pickdrop.com, enter the promo code PHOTOBANTER, one word, when you sign up and you'll get three months free of the PickDrop file transfer tool. And as always, I'll be having weekly podcasts every week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, as well as YouTube. You can go check out the video version at the PHOTOBANTER YouTube page. And uh, as always, thanks so much for listening and take care.